Well, we're going to go to the Word of God. And if you have a Bible, we are in the book of Romans. And we've been in the book of Romans for the last month. And uh, we're in a series called Walking the Romans Road. And um, we've been looking at the first uh, one and a half two chapters uh, where Paul initially affirms to the church in Rome the message that they heard from Peter 24 years before when they were in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and affirming that Jesus is the Messiah. Let me just make that declaration right now. Jesus is the Messiah. He is the true living God. And so they go back to Rome and they plant a church in Rome. And all that they had really was just the Old Testament scriptures, what we call the, the Torah, which is the, the, the books of Moses and, and the prophets. But they also they had the eyewitness accounts that people had seen Jesus die and be resurrected, proving that he is the Messiah. And a church was built on that foundation. And Paul goes on to say that, that he and us, even today, we are indebted by God to preach the gospel that saved us. And so it's relevant for us. And this is why we're getting into our evangelism programs. It's not just about sitting back and learning theoretically, but we want to go out and do what God has called us to do. Amen? In whatever format that might be. And, and Paul says that he is not ashamed of the gospel. And we are not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation to them that believe. The power is in the gospel itself and not in our ability to present it. That should encourage someone this morning. That it doesn't matter if we're timid. People's lives are saved when they hear the gospel, when they hear the good news of Jesus. Amen? But then he goes on, he goes deep, and he says, Paul says that God's anger and his judgment are revealed from heaven in different forms against the godless and wicked society, that generation that has suppressed the truth and exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And there's that saying that says there is nothing new under the sun. We are in a generation yet again, as has been previously, of people who are godless and wicked, who are, have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and suppress the truth so that others will not be exposed to it. And God's anger and his judgment burn from heaven. And Paul addresses society, but not just in Roman times, but God is, Paul is addressing society as we see it even today. He addresses the sexually immoral. He addresses the backstabbers, the, the gossips. He addresses the haters of God, the insolent, the arrogant, those who disobey their parents, those who break covenants, those who are faithless, those who are without love and without mercy. It just sounds like the age that we live in. The Bible is still as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. But he, then he talks to the church, effectively us, saying, but we are not allowed to judge these people. That's not our business. That's God's business. And the other reason we're not allowed to judge is because we, we, we were like that before. But God has saved us out of that. He also says that God's judgment isn't always seen. It's not necessarily recognized. But what he says is that his judgment, God's judgment, is just. And his judgment is just because he is just. Amen. He is the truth. But now, as we're going to go on, he addresses the Jews and their relationship with the law. And by the law, we don't just mean Leviticus or just the Ten Commandments. We are talking about the first five books of the Bible as we know them. How by having the law, somehow it made them better in their own eyes compared to other people. And, and so Paul calls out this hypocrisy. How all have sinned 
not just the Jews who should have known better because they had the law, but also the Gentiles who had the law of God written on their hearts or on their conscience. We should all know better. So he's calling out all of that. And he's saying that only forgiveness is only found in Jesus Christ. Jesus, who is both the Savior, but he is also the judge. And so we're going to go on. And, and so what I've done, I've, I've put this passage, because it's a long passage, from Romans chapter 2, verse 17, to the end of chapter 3. So rather than hearing my voice for the next six minutes, we're going to have somebody else's lovely voice, and you can watch it on the screen. So Romans 2, 17, through to the end of chapter 3. Romans chapter 2, the Jews and the law. You who call yourselves Jews are relying on God's law, and you boast about your special relationship with him. You know what he wants. You know what is right because you have been taught his law. You are convinced that you are a guide for the blind and a light for people who are lost in darkness. You think you can instruct the ignorant and teach children the ways of God. For you are certain that God's law gives you complete knowledge and truth. Well, then if you teach others, why don't you teach yourself? You tell others not to steal, but do you steal? You say it is wrong to commit adultery, but do you commit adultery? You condemn idolatry, but do you use items stolen from pagan temples? You are so proud of knowing the law, but you dishonor God by breaking it. No wonder the scriptures say the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you. The Jewish ceremony of circumcision has value only if you obey God's law. But if you don't obey God's law, you are no better off than an uncircumcised Gentile. And if the Gentiles obey God's law, won't God declare them to be his own people? In fact, uncircumcised Gentiles who keep God's law will condemn you Jews who are circumcised and possess God's law but don't obey it. For you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by God's Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. Romans chapter 3. God remains faithful. Then what's the advantage of being a Jew? Is there any value in the ceremony of circumcision? Yes, there are great benefits. First of all, the Jews were entrusted with the whole revelation of God. True, some of them were unfaithful, but just because they were unfaithful, does that mean that God will be unfaithful? Of course not. Even if everyone else is a liar, God is true. As the scriptures say about him, you will be proved right in what you say, and you will win your case in court. But some might say our sinfulness serves a good purpose, for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for him to punish us? This is merely a human point of view. Of course not. If God were not entirely fair, how would he be qualified to judge the world? But some might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? And some might even slander us by claiming that we say, the more we sin, the better it is. Those who say such things deserve to be condemned. All people are sinners. Well then, should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law 
simply shows us how sinful we are. Christ took our punishment. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just, and he declares sinners to be right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Of course he is. There's only one God and he makes people right with himself only by faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. So I'd encourage you to read that passage throughout the week. It's quite a long one, but I've just got some thoughts about this passage that we've just heard. So even, even before we get to that passage in chapter 2, in verses 12 to 15, we, we looked at this a little bit last week where Paul is speaking to religious people, moralist people, legalistic people. These are people who go to church and they do the right things and they say the right things. Paul is addressing people like that. The Jews were like that. They knew the law of God. They knew the Torah. They went to synagogue. They made sacrifice, sacrifices to him, but their heart wasn't God's. And we still have that situation today. So people who go to church, they they even know long passages of the Bible, and they think to themselves, yep, I'm good. But Paul hits out at these people as well. He calls them out as hypocrites. And he says that even their spiritual lives are on the line now. He says to the Jews, if you live by the law alone, you will be judged by that law. And if you, even if you commit one error according to the law, it says, you're as guilty as if you'd broken all of the laws. And it's today, it's the same for the churchgoer, the, the person who's read the Bible through and should know better. The person will be judged by the standard of God's word. Just knowing the Bible or just stepping through the doors of a church just won't do. It's nowhere near good enough. But Paul says that we have to obey the word of God. We have to obey the law of God. But of course, as Christians, our first act of obedience is, is not sacrificing animals like the Jews of old did. It's not about performing rites. It's not about ceremonies or remembering festivals. Rather, our first act of obedience to the law is putting our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And the work that he did on the cross. John chapter 6, 28 and 29 says, Then they, which is the crowd that was around Jesus, asked him, what must, what must we do to do the works God requires? So they do, they're talking about actions. Well, what do we have to do to be accepted by God? And Jesus answered, I can imagine a pause in the middle of his phrase, so just for the punchline. The work of God is this to believe 
than the one that he sent. That's it. The only action, the only quote unquote works that God requires of us is for us to put our faith in Jesus Christ, to believe in him. But religious people, the legalist, puts their faith in their own actions of going to church, knowing about the Bible, even doing some good deeds. And by the way, these are not evil people. They look good on the outside to other people, but they're putting their faith in their own works instead of putting their faith in Jesus. And in so doing, they're condemning themselves. They're condemned by the very Bible that they have read through three or four times. Because the Bible says only those who can fulfill the law completely are justified by God. But we're all condemned because we've broken at least one of the laws of God. No one can do it. And that's the whole point of what God is doing and what Paul is teaching us. Paul is setting us up for something. No one except Jesus was able to fulfill the law completely. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 says, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. He's saying no one will be declared righteous or be made right with God just by observing or following the law. As we heard on, our, on the NLT version just now, that line says the law simply shows us how sinful we are. That's the purpose of the law. When we hold up the law against ourselves, it shows us, oh my goodness, I am really bad. And the law goes even deeper. What we read in the Old Testament, Jesus takes it a step further. So as an example, we might say, well, I've never murdered anyone. But Jesus in Matthew 5, 21 onwards says, you've heard it said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, which is an Aramaic offensive term to someone, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. And other people say, well, I've, I've, I've never committed adultery. But Jesus goes on in Matthew 5. He says, You've heard it, it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart with her. The law of God was given to show us what sin is. It was given to show us how sinful we are. And Paul says to the Jews, those who had the law, as well as to the religious legalists who attend church, he says, not even you get away with this. It's so easy to, to look at the, the immoral person outside. But he's talking to us, those who are in the church. And he's also saying, those people are saying really, in, in effect, that the work of Jesus on the cross was really not really enough. It wasn't enough. And it's almost as though the, the people are saying, well, Jesus, thank you for dying. It was a, such, a, such a lovely gesture. But now look at me. Look at what I'm doing to help you save me. I, I, I hope I made that sound ridiculous because I'm sure it's that ridiculous in the ears of God. When we try and do works to be accepted by him, to try and be saved by him. I don't think God smiles at that at all. I mean, when you look at Scripture, he doesn't look down and go, oh, how sweet. You tried so hard. Well done. The Bible says, no, those people are also under the wrath of God. 
This is a serious topic for God. So in the beginning of our, our passage, Paul is, is talking to the Jews. And he, he says, you think you know it all. You've got it all sus because you know the Bible. You've read it. But he says, you look down on other people in your arrogance. And you tell people to do things that you are not doing. He's calling out hypocrisy. He's telling them that also that religion has no means, has no way of changing someone's heart. Religion has, it was not designed for that. Only the Holy Spirit comes to change the heart. He's saying it might be in your head, but it's definitely not in your heart. This is what he's telling the religious people in verse 23 of this passage in the NLT he says you're so proud of knowing the law but you dishonor God by breaking it so he thinks he's calling out this hypocrisy but then he goes on in the next verse he says no wonder the scriptures say the Gentiles blaspheme the name of God because of you the Jews weren't holding up their sign of, of the covenant they were living really badly and so the pagans around them we're looking at the Jews and looking at the Jewish God and thinking, well, they're just as bad as we are. Why bother changing? I'm doing the same things that you're doing. I don't need to change my God. And so they look down on them because the pagans looking down on the Jews because they're not living consecrated, separated lives, which they were called to do. And it's the same message for the church today. If, if people watch us and they see there is no difference from up between us and the world, they'll think we're hypocritical. Just hypocrites. Why do I need to change? I'm already living like you. I don't need to change anything. And really the message to us as believers is, if you are living like this, what gospel are you preaching to the world by the way you live? Is it something that honors God? Is it, is it a life of consecration and separation to God? Or are you living, are we living as the world lives? Because if we do that, they'll look at us and go, no change, why bother? We have so many examples that we heard from earlier. <clears throat> so much sexual immorality going on in the church. I'm not suggesting here, but the church in general. Whether that's heterosexual or homosexual. But there are other things that were listed in Romans 1 that talk about control and manipulation. But it could be other things like, are you fiddling the books at work? Are you paying your taxes? Paying to Caesar what belongs to Caesar? To use Jesus' quote. Are you paying back debts that you owe? It doesn't stop in the congregation. It applies to preachers too. There are so many preachers who are preaching this prosperity gospel. Give your money, give your money, give your money. They've, they've taken the truth and they've made it a lie. And the ones who get rich, by the way, are the ones who are preaching. Other people keep giving and not getting much in return. There is so much that's going on in the church, and all of these things stain the church. And by association, it's a stain on the good name of God. People associate the immorality and the, and the wrongs of the church with God. And if we don't practice what we preach, and preach what we practice, we are open to mockery and scorn. And ultimately, so is Jesus, because of us. And this is what Paul is calling out. Even back in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 12, in the story of David and Bathsheba, the prophet Nathan rebukes David because he brought God's name into disrepute. This was as bad as the sin itself. Isaiah 52, 5 says, God says, all day long my name is constantly blasphemed. Paul goes on into chapter 3, and he's saying that this is the state of the Jewish people right now. 
those who have backslidden. But then he asks the question, he says, because Israel is unfaithful, is, that all, is all that God did for them suddenly nullified? He says, no, of course not. He says, God is true. His word is still true. Do you believe that today? His word is unchanging. And it shows that we, the rest of us, we are all liars. We're all sinners. Whether we're Jew, Jews or we're Gentiles. It's all of us. And then verses 10 to 18, we saw this long list of, of quotes from the Psalms just telling us and reminding us how sinful we are, how evil we are. And Paul hammers us and the Jews for over two chapters, on and on and on and on. But thankfully, he gets to verse 21 in chapter 3. In the New Living Translation, and I, and I love this because it's easy to follow. He says, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes. Who? 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 True for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. And I just, do you know what? Because I, I was reading through it and studying, I thought, boy, this is heavy stuff. And I actually read these two verses and breathed a sigh of relief. Oof. There is good news. Finally, there's a way to be declared not guilty. And it's by trusting Jesus to take away our sins. Hallelujah. It means putting our confidence in Jesus to forgive us of all our sins and to make us right with God. It's what Jesus does for us. And he also gives us the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can live the life that he wants us to live. The gift is for everyone who believes. Isn't that amazing? No matter who we are, and incidentally, no matter what we've done, there is no sin too great that cannot be forgiven by Jesus. Romans 3, 23, 25, we know 23 very well. It says, for everyone has sinned. Everyone. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. Freely. This is easy for God when we put our faith in Jesus. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. No more animals. Jesus was the Lamb of God. Sent by God to be the perfect sacrifice for sin. He goes on, he says, People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. That's it. That's the gospel right there. That's the good news. Paul explains that God declares that we are righteous. We have been made right. We have been justified by God. What that means is that's a legal term that means that we are declared not guilty by God. And when a judge in a court declares someone not guilty in a court of law, all the charges against you are removed from records. Even the accusation against you is removed from all records. This is what God has done for, my, for us. Hallelujah. When God forgives us, he declares us not guilty and he wipes away every sin from our record. It's not there anymore. The Psalms even tell us that he's removed our transgression from us. 
as far as the east is from the west. So far he, has he removed our transgressions from us. Isn't that amazing? We're talking universe here. We're not just talking planet Earth. They're gone. It's as if we had never sinned. Isn't that incredible? We know. We struggle we, because we remember. But God has chosen to remember no more. Somebody needs to hear that this morning because it will help you forgive yourself. God has chosen. It's not, it's not like he's forgotten. He's like, uh, it's like Phil, what, what was it you did? It's nothing, it's nothing passive with God. He actively has chosen not to remember my sinful life. Praise God. He does this because he's taken our sins, took my sin, and he placed it on Jesus at the cross. What a mystery. Through all of time, from Abraham to when Jesus comes back, all sin placed on Jesus to them that believe. And Jesus' blood and death was that price that needed to be paid for our freedom, to pay for our sin. Jesus gave his life in exchange for ours. Instead of us being on the cross, which we deserve, we still deserve it, Jesus exchanged his life for mine. Isn't that incredible? We shouldn't take this for granted. He died that I might live. He died that you might live. It goes on in verse 25, and he says something about the immense power of the cross and the mystery of the cross of Jesus. He says, this sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and didn't punish those who sinned in times past. He's talking about the people before the cross. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. So the time that Paul is writing in, the time of, of, of Jesus' death and resurrection. And he said, God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just. And he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Today, we, we get to look back at the cross. We can see what Jesus did, but we know what the effect is in our lives right now. But those people before the cross, back to the time of Adam, they were, they were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, the one who would redeem Israel. They were God's faithful believers. And even though they didn't know Jesus' name, or when he would come, their faith was still in him to save them, to save the people. The power of God's salvation at the cross, cross reached back thousands and thousands of years, as it does thousands and thousands of years after, until Jesus comes again. That is the power of the cross of Jesus, the power of the blood of Jesus, which still saves today. It's still changing my life today. Is it changing your life as well? So here's Paul's conclusion. In verse 27 to 28, he says, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No. Because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not obeying the law. Every other religion requires a person to perform duties and rites and ceremonies, even do good deeds to be acceptable and accepted by their gods. Christianity is the only one that says none of these things are acceptable to God. The void between our sense of morality and God's morality is infinite. The only way we can be saved and be accepted by God to be made right with God 
is to trust in what God has done for us. On our behalf. God did it on our behalf. God reached down from heaven and he rescued us. Because he knew we would never reach him. He reached us instead. All we need to do is put our faith in Jesus alone. And God only accepts repentance and faith. Repentance is the first step. It's that changing of the mind. It's turning away from sin, turning to God. And then he gives a gift of faith. Faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that God raised him from the dead. That's all it requires. Repentance and faith. We don't have to do anything to earn our salvation. Good works, they come later. They come after that. We'll talk about that at some other time. But we just need faith in Jesus. And faith in Jesus eliminates our pride. Our pride in our own abilities and our own works. Faith, because faith isn't a deed that we do. Faith then lifts up or exalts what Jesus has done. What Jesus did in our lives, continues to do for us. It's not about what we do. Faith acknowledges also that we cannot keep the law. We are simply incapable of keeping the law of God because we are far from perfect. And faith acknowledges that. God, I am so imperfect. The only perfect thing about me is that I am imperfect. I am perfectly imperfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Amen? Faith is based then on our relationship with God. God's relationship with us. It's not about our self-seeking performance for God. It's about God. And then Paul lands the plane then in this chapter. He says, well, is the law nullified? Do we just throw the law away now? He says, no, 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 of course not. We can't forget about it because God still has his standards to live by. But Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law because he was the one who fulfilled the law perfectly. He's the only one. Only then, when we put our faith in Jesus, the one who fulfilled the law on our behalf, this is, this is the work of God. Jesus came to fulfill the law knowing that we could not. So when we are in Jesus, when we are in Christ, we put our faith in him, Jesus has got us covered. Amen? This is when we are justified. Jesus did it for us and on our behalf so that we could be rescued, so that we could be saved. There's nothing for us to do except put our trust in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the work that you did. You lived a perfect life. You fulfilled the law, your own law. You did it perfectly. Now all we need to do is repent and believe. And when we are drawn to the cross and we are saved by you because of what you did on the cross for us we are now justified the law is fulfilled because of you Lord we, you knew we could never live up to your standard I thank you Jesus that you saved us, you rescued us you have declared us not guilty you have wiped the slate clean. Everything we ever did has been put, nailed on the cross with Jesus. Forever we will always say thank you. Thank you, Jesus.
thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for saving me. 